All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to Protecting the Galaxy session. Uh, it's a multi-region disaster recovery with OpenStack and Ceph. And the reason we picked this theme is not just because we have a cool spaceship to showcase today, but I want to actually to focus on the stars in this slide. And the reason is that once in every 14, pretty much 14 OpenStack releases, stars are going to be aligned. And we're here actually to showcase you this formation of OpenStack maturing uh, to a point where we can actually discuss uh, delivering multi-site um, and with Ceph, uh, a new innovation cycle, uh, two, two lines uh, are now crossed. And uh, without further ado, let's go ahead and start. Uh, so I'll start with our savers uh, for today's talk. Um, we'll try to be, do it as light as we can. There's a lot of technology and content today in our talk, so we're going to leave a lot of room for Q&A and allow you to adjust and digest, hopefully. <laughs> and, and if not, come, just come to see us after that. Um, so I'll start with me. I'm a, a product manager for OpenStack. I, take uh, basically a uh, look at everything storage in OpenStack, and I've been uh, monitoring disaster recovery from day one of OpenStack pretty much. Uh, so this is a very uh, close and warm topic to my heart. Uh, Sebastian? Yeah, I'm Sebastian Han, uh, working on uh, several topics like OpenStack, Ceph, and more recently containers. Uh, always been focusing on uh, integrating Ceph into OpenStack, um, and uh, from time to time I do blogging as well. Federico? And I'm Federico Uchradi, I work in Red Hat Storage Business Unit as a product manager on Ceph. All right, so we'll start with a quick disclaimer before you take the tag from your, the new uh, shiny OpenStack and Ceph. Uh, this presentation is only focuses on data disaster recovery. Uh, the reason is disaster recovery in OpenStack is a huge topic, right? It, ha it involves every, any given service in OpenStack because your whole site with your whole OpenStack infrastructure goes down, right? And you need to basically be able to resolve for that. Um, however, we're going to touch about, because we're going to talk about different architectures, configurations, of course, we're going to talk about what it takes. But the focus is the turnkey that we're looking at today is actually how we're going to enable you to uh, survive a disaster uh, working with OpenStack and stuff. Um, so we'll start with a mission. Uh, the mission is pretty clear, right? It's also in the title. Uh, the idea is actually to seamlessly and transparently back up your OpenStack images and block devices from one site to another. Uh, so in a vase of failure resources, basically in site A can be manually brought up in the site B, right? Um, and when we talk about images, we'll, we'll, we'll let you know exactly what we mean by that. Um, and here we are. So we have pretty much design principles. Some of the design principles actually are good for OpenStack in general, not just for application, right? As a practices. So while you're designing uh, your cloud environment, uh, you need to make sure that your images are templates uh, of your application. So that is what we're basically replicating to the other side, and everything needs to be in that, in that template level. Uh, application data is always hosted on Cinder block devices, right? Why? We need persistent storage. When it comes to a thermal storage, uh, uh, we basically are looking, this is where all the VM or thermal uh, uh, life lives on, on typically a machine root disk. If something goes down there, and it's corrupted or whatever, right? This is not what you want to back up. So this is the only probably configuration uh, storage that you don't need to maintain on a persistent storage. And we actually not uh, care about the thermal storage. We're not going to deal with it at all in the replication uh, failure domain. Um, finally, the, the application stack is managed by heat. We're using heat in this example, but you can use your any favorite automation tool, such as Ansible or whatever. Um, and in a failure scenario, the user basically uh, simply rebootstrap the application stack uh, using HIT in our case, and uh, basically configures it using the configuration management system that basically uh, you can start the application on the target site. Now, keep in mind, site A is not identical to site B. Network topology may change, et cetera. So where you need, this is where the configuration ma management comes into play to allow you to uh, uh, retweak the um, he te uh, uh, templates accordingly so you can replay the configuration on the target side. Of course, you have floating IPs uh, to allow you to do it, but again, uh, there are changes that needs to happen. So when you do this fail over to another side, you may need to make sure that you have this configuration in hand. What it means is that don't wait for <laughs> a disaster to happen to prepare for that, that you need to maintain and record your topology on the other side, be able to prepare such templates in event so you can actually do this failover to the other end. Um, 
All right. So where we are right now, uh, uh, this is a long-standing effort basically to build our galaxy. And as you know, we're, we're looking at OpenSec and, and Ceph today. And if you look at just the diagram today where we are, we're at the point where we have a fully integrated system, right? We're all the way from Keystone, Swift, Cinder, Glance, Nova, Manila now with the new CephFS driver that we introduced in Mitaka, and Celometer, right? So we, we, all of the services that we need to protect are, are already there and uh, we have a very solid starting point uh, to extend. Now, the good news is a lot of you started with one OpenStack deployment, right? You have a single site, and now that it matures, you move to production, it's time to basically uh, uh, take care of how do we basically back it up, how we basically have a disaster recovery plan for it. Now, the good news is you can start small and grow up. You don't, this, you don't need to re-architect your cloud just to support multi-site. That's the beauty of it, all right? Uh, so we start with single site and then another one later, and at the end, if you don't need to basically re-architect your cloud or application or anything, just to support it. So it's, it's, a, it's a, an organic disaster recovery. And with that, uh, let's start to zoom one by one to the use cases architecture. Yeah. Thanks, Sean. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to be presenting some uh, architecture example that aim to address the uh, multi-site use case. So the first one we have is rather simple, and it, it can be basically called the recovery site, where you effectively have a single OpenStack site with cloud controllers, uh, computes, and a Ceph cluster, where on the other side, you just have a single Ceph cluster. Um, then why are we doing this? I mean, and it's really fair to ask, why would it, wouldn't it be easier to simply stretch the cluster across both locations? Um, to answer that, you have to remember that uh, Ceph by design is uh, synchronous and st strongly consistent. Uh, that means basically uh, for a client to get its right uh, acknowledged, all the replicas must be written. So if you do multi-site stretched, uh, multi-site but with a stretched Ceph cluster, you will definitely introduce uh, higher latencies uh, and potentially a lower bandwidth as well. So. Remember here, it's uh, a block storage use case, so it's really counterproductive to do this because we are aiming for low latencies and really high performance. So uh, basically, in order to overcome this uh, synchronous design of Ceph, we had to come up with uh, a new functionality that was added in the latest release of Ceph, uh, Joule, came out last week, to, um, that is called RBD mirroring, which will allow us to simply um, synchronously replicate images, uh, and by images I mean um, just like all the Ceph images, not the OpenStack images. Uh, within Ceph, we call a block device an image, but it's uh, from an OpenStack perspective, it's block devices and uh, glance images. So to seamlessly replicate all of those images from one site to the other one. So now, if we get back to the design, um, it's um, we take the assumption, of course, that. Um, we, have, we use the same L2 segment just to make sure that you can properly do uh, well, the replication and, and set it up. Um, it's not a real challenge, but the failover procedure is um, if you follow the, the properties of the design, uh, it should be uh, really easy. Um, if we have to, um, let's take the example, you're using your uh, Ceph monitors, the Ceph cluster goes down, uh, and, and you, don't, you don't have any storage available on site one. Uh, what you will have to do is to basically promote the second site, uh, which effectively means um, pulling all the images that were on the second site as primary. Then they will be able to receive IOs, so perform IO operations, and then read writes and stuff like this. Um, then what you will have to do is to reconfigure and reconnect all the OpenStack services that were once connected to the initial cluster. Uh, this is quite transparent if you follow the rule of having both clusters uh, built with the exact same FSID. Uh, it's just really convenient for Glance because the way we store Glance images within, um, the way we store Ceph images within Glance is by using um, a URL which takes the form of RBD colon dash dash some uh, cluster FSID slash pool slash image UID and then the snapshot. So if you do this, you'll be able to transparently restart your services and then they will find that the cluster has the same FSID and that the image is just simply accessible. Same goes, of course, for the L2 segment. So it's, um, it's fairly easy, but um, depending on how you deployed uh, both sites, depending on the dis distance between both sites, uh, 
you, it, this is not a permanent relocation of the services, uh, which means that at some point you will have to roll back uh, the images that are, no, that, that, are, that are now being used on the second cluster into the initial one. So what you will have to do is, um, once you're losing the first F cluster, you promote the second side, you restart all the services, and then you right away start rebuilding the initial self cluster with the same FS ID again, and you start backfilling images. Once you're done, we know it's just, this will probably include some downtime and uh, operational measures, but you have to do this because otherwise you will be running all of your workloads from another site. So it's just like uh, temporary relocation. So now moving on to uh, the next two designs, uh, which will, um, which, which fold uh, into a complete different category where the previous design was uh, really focused on uh, storage multi-site. Uh, on, the on, on the next two examples, uh, we will also be providing uh, guidelines for uh, doing the OpenStack multi-site implementation. Uh, so we took the approach of using uh, multiple isolated OpenStack. So we basically have a single site and end site after, and we just do a single OpenStack environment. We do not stretch anything uh, across regions and, uh, or anything like this. Um, the principle is that we keep on reusing the RBD mirroring feature, so we uh, just have this cross replication from site A to site B and all the images are available on both sites at the same time. Uh, so we, we decide to, of course, replicate glance images in pseudo-block devices. Um, and then in, even, in an event of a failure, we will simply, uh, we will have the ability to recover uh, data from the other site. Uh, so let's jump into the first design, uh, which we call regions uh, with no shared keystone. Uh, so as mentioned here, we just have, uh, it's a completely different dimension. Uh, it's a real OpenStack multi-site where we um, have just isolated OpenStack environments. We don't share anything. The only thing that is being configured is just the RBD mirroring in between. So it's just like C arrows from one side to the other. It's just cross replication. Uh, here, um, keystone sits on uh, the cloud controllers, just uh, just as usual, from an operation pr from an operator perspective, the only thing you have to do is just to uh, create and register like uh, regions and endpoints. Uh, so every user can just uh, easily log on one region and the other using their own credentials. Uh, same principle again. Uh, use the same cluster FS ID. Uh, when it comes to uh, challenges now, when we have to recover from a failure. Uh, it's a little bit more, a uh, little bit trickier because um, we don't have, we currently don't have any ways to uh, replicate OpenStack metadata. And by metadata, I mean everything that, uh, everything from glance to Cinder uh, image properties, image IDs, and Cinder volumes, snapshots, and stuff like this. Um, so when we have to recover, what we have to do is once again promote the second si promote the second side, so we have the older images available. But then what, you have to, what we will have to do is to, it's kind of a hacky way to do it, but uh, as I said at the moment, there is no other proper way to do it. We will have to um, append uh, database records from site A to site B, so we will be using the, the tables from uh, site one and import them into site B. Uh, so the open stack on the second site will uh, have the impression basically that all the images, well, it's not an impression because images and, and volumes are already there, so it's just like we are registering uh, all of those volumes um, in the second site. So moving on now to our um, third and last design, um, which is called the Shared Keystone with Regions, and it's uh, it's really um, an announced version of the uh, of the second one. Because here we are trying to make everyone's life e easier by having um, by basically extracting the Keystone database from. Uh, uh, all the controllers and put uh, that database uh, on dedicated servers. Uh, that w then we will have uh, a replication happening uh, across both sites. And the principle is that Keystone servers will be connected to uh, this um, MySQL cluster. Uh, obviously, this comes with um, a couple of challenges uh, since we have to store a couple of things uh, into that database where Keystone owns, like. Um, uh, users, groups, um, endpoints, uh, assignments, uh, tenants, and stuff like that. But more importantly, uh, all the tokens. And um, 
and the issue with that is that we, we are currently, we're just like generating tons and tons of, of tokens. Um, and at some point, this might be, well, just um, a little bit tricky to, to, to have that replication happening over one, uh, over long dis distances. Um, but um, we have to do this because we, uh, we cannot currently use the Fernet tokens yet. Um, and this is uh, the ultimate goal, uh, the ultimate goal using Fernet tokens. For those of you who are not familiar with Fernet tokens, um, basically Fernet tokens are a new way to generate tokens within Keystone using the symmetric, uh, symmetric encryption mechanism, uh, where we make the usage of a private key so we can encrypt uh, tokens. So basically, Keystone generates the tokens, payload, and put tons of information into that payload, like uh, user tenants and stuff like that. And we use the private key to encrypt that token. We deliver it to the user, and when the user wants to authenticate, it will just uh, send that token to uh, to the servers. The servers will go to Keystone and say, "Okay, well, this this token is valid." Um, the good news with Fernet tokens is that we we they don't require any persistence, so we don't have to store any tokens in a database. So that's uh, a really good thing, but uh, we're not there yet. Uh, they we. The goal uh, from the Keystone is uh, that uh, Fernet tokens should be um, available uh, by default uh, from Newton, that's uh, what I heard. We currently have a couple of issues with uh, Fernet tokens, such as key, uh, uh, Keystone v2 uh, trusts and, um, and, uh, and forgot the other one, but um, well, um, yeah, with, and also um, the blah, blah, yeah, forget it, <laughs> forget it. <laughs> Forget it. It's uh, trust, and okay. Well, I'm gonna, not, not going to lose time on this. Yeah, it's revocation. Uh, yeah, uh, happening too frequently. So since it's an announced version of uh, the previous design, the recovery procedure uh, remains the same. Just promote the first, promote the second site, append database records, and uh, and it should be good to go. Um, so now I'll hand, hand it over to Federico, who will be introducing and uh, doing a deep dive into the. Next RBD feature, mm -hmm. RBD mirroring. <coughs> All righty. So, as Seb was saying, this was introduced with uh, Sage's Jewel release last week, so it's brand new. RBD mirroring is easily the most requested feature we have for block storage, so it should prove popular. The problem is most users that um, come from certain sectors like FSI require a secondary disaster recovery site. They are happy with the resiliency of Ceph or with the fact that it's HA, but they have to plan for the fact that the primary site might completely disappear. With that in mind, uh, we have introduced um, functionality that asynchronously mirrors from a primary cluster to the disaster recovery site. This is done through a new daemon called RBD mirror that synchronizes the images the volume images from the active site to the DR site. Um, these are synchronized in a point-in-time point consistent fashion so that when the primary site abruptly disappears, you still have a consistent image at the secondary, not a corrupted one. This uh, relies on two new RBD image features, um, well, a feature and a setting. Uh, one is journaling of images, and the other one is uh, the mirroring setting to indicate that you want this image actually mirrored. There are two ways that mirroring can occur. We can mirror anything that's in a given pool, or we can mirror select images, in which case you have to flag which ones. Uh, images have states, primary and non-primary, as um, right now the system is being tested with only two sites. However, there are no architectural reasons why why this wouldn't work with end sites. It's just not something that we haven't tested yet. And that influences the terminology so that we don't have primary and secondary, but only primary and non-primary. The non-primary image is non-writable. So <clears throat> what's the, uh, the right path looking like? An IO operation is generated. It goes to libRBD as usual. Then it's written to the journal. The write is acknowledged to the client and afterwards it's written to the image. The RBD mirror daemon running at the remote site uh, um, accesses the local RADOS cluster, pulls the data changes from the journal, and reproduces these changes in the remote site images. 
The important thing to uh, note here is that this is a pull from the RBD mirror daemon at the remote site. So um, the mirror daemon needs to have a complete routable connectivity to the full RADOS cluster at the primary site. And if you are configuring things in a bi-directional fa fashion, which is entirely possible if you want to load balance and some images are primary in one cluster and some images are primary in the other cluster and they are, they're crossing each other and you have two daemons, they mutually must be able to access the whole cluster. Here are the details of how this is actually set up. Um, you have to have different names for the clusters. As I was saying, you must have full routable connectivity between the, the two RADOS clusters. You deploy the daemon at the secondary site. You create pools that have consistent configuration at the primary and at the secondary. Then you instruct the pool uh, with the peering command. You tell the pool where it is peering to so that it, it discovers the secondary. And then, uh, depending on whether you have set the pool to be every image replicated or only some images replicated, you might have to flag uh, which image will, um, will be replicated or it may be redundant if you're uh, replicating the entire pool. You also need to enable journaling on the images, which you can do at image creation time or you can do later um, 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 setting uh, using a, an RBD setting. What are the limitations today? Well, um, as I was saying previously, we're only supporting two sites. Um, we don't have HA coverage just yet. And this is libRBD only at this point. Uh, we don't have support in KRBD. Majority of users are using libRBD, so that shouldn't be too much of a limitation. Um, this is in the dual release um, from last week. And it is going to be in the supported Red Hat Ceph product, uh, which will label 2.0 coming this summer. And now my illustrious colleague will tell you how we merge this into OpenStack. I'm going back. OK, thanks, Federico. Uh, so um, now let's uh, briefly explore uh, some of the new capabilities that we have um, from, from Mitaka. Uh, Sindel folks have been working on a new version of the replication API uh, 2.1, uh, which will um, basically allow us to, uh, it's just a, a replication API. So um, it's just kind of a <coughs> an enabler for us to, uh, to say when we have to trigger um, a balancing uh, in the failover. So um, basically it works with uh, Sindel types where we, we will have an extra capability of it on a type and it will say, okay, this is, uh, a type that is uh, being replicated. Uh, it works. The, the main difference now uh, from from 2.0 and 2.1 is that uh, this replication works at the pool level or at the type level uh, because well the type level, which means from Ceph perspective, uh, the pool level. Uh, so if something goes wrong, we can completely fail over or send a command to do the failover uh, from one type backend to another, which will effectively be um, a different Ceph cluster in our case. Uh, this is definitely uh, the foundation of all the work we have been doing. I mean, underneath, uh, with uh, from from the self perspective, uh, to, uh, to 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 be able to perform uh, disaster recovery. So um, now I'll just oh yeah, <laughs> but I had only two slides, uh, only one. So now uh, let's do uh, a final kind of a final recap about uh, the gap analysis. Um, one is about Keystone, but. Uh, this one should be, um, sh should be solved by, by Newton. Uh, that's the goal of the Keystone team. Uh, no, no real production readiness for finite tokens yet. Um, then we, um, about OpenStack metadata, uh, currently no ways to properly replicate Glance, uh, as Monova and Cinder uh, metadata from one side to another. Uh, fortunately, there is an, an initiative uh, from the Open NFV guys that is called Kimbird, um, which aims to um, implement a centralized service uh, for uh, multi-region, uh, multi-site deployments for OpenStack. Uh, this would basically take the form of a new agent that would be responsible for synchronizing uh, several metadata from the OpenStack environment. I think the scope for now is to do Nova, but we would like to extend it to Cinder and also to Glance just to, to make sure that um, 
both sides know uh, each other uh, before we are triggering a recovery. It's one of the um, only corner cases we have because uh, we have the ability now to do the replication at the um, uh, at the safe level, but uh, we need to find a way to tell the OpenStack that uh, everything is happening at the same time. We might be also working on implementing kind of a lock and a consistent mechanism to make sure that an image that is being copied is also available uh, on the OpenStack metadata on the other side. Uh, so we make sure that we have both, um, for example, glance, the, the glance image ID in the glance um, catalog from the other side and that the image is also being copied uh, or just uh, copied because it's an image uh, on the uh, on the other side. So this is um, this project is a real uh, enabler, and uh, we uh, we really invite you uh, to to push on it. We will be investing uh, on that project as well because we believe it's to, uh, the right way to do multi-site. Um, 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 because uh, we also think that things like sales and others uh, are way too complex. Uh, it's it has been here for years and uh, barely no one has, has it implemented and it's uh, for, full of caveats and things like that. So we, we took the approach of finding a much easier um, way of deploying multi-site environments. Uh, as we explained, like isolated OpenStack environments, easy to deploy, easy to maintain, easy to upgrade, uh, no fancy stuff, no stretched things, uh, no additional component. Uh, this, this one is probably the key to enable us to do real and easy multi-site deployments. So I'll let uh, Sean uh, put all that, all those things together. Thank you, Sebastian. Yeah. So you saw where we are in Mitaka and and uh, at, and starting the Newton release, right? So uh, in a sense, I, I want to take us back to the beginning. I talked about the stars and the formation. So we talked about Cinder, for example. So Cinder has now the f almost starting the fifth version of Replication API, right? And the reason is, until now, we didn't have a proper way to do it, which is across different backends. As you heard from Sebastian, the support to do at the pool level was just introduced in this cycle. Uh, we actually uh, disabled in this release the V2 replication in Cinder, and, and, and now all the two uh, one APIs were starting to basically appear right now uh, fr from the vendors. Uh, so in a sense, we have a maturity point with Cinder. Cinder, by the way, has a great Cinder backup capabilities as well, that the only uh, uh, service in OpenStack today that has a, a backup capabilities to for the metadata of the service itself. So when you create a backup of your volumes, you can actually capture the metadata of the service as well when you do replication. As you saw, we have steel gaps, for example, around Glance, et cetera. This is why we need a project like uh, uh, Kingbird to come and, and, and look at OpenStack as a system level, right? We're talking about so many services, but we need, finally, we to, uh, OpenStack has matured to a point where we need to do things at, uh, uh, at the system level. We know things that doesn't work, such, such as sales, right, in terms of the job chains. I think we believe that this is the way to go. Uh, some of these principles are already implemented uh, uh, today, and, and, and we're glad to see that finally we have a, a step back uh, in the community so we can uh, drive OpenStack forward and really support multi-site configurations. So, um, as noted, uh, for this release, Newton, that's starting right now, uh, we have already a blueprint for the RBD drivers in the replication uh, to make use of, of the new RBD mirroring that Federico covered uh, uh, with all the necessary changes. Um, uh, Cinder replication itself, uh, 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 the next version, actually we started to have the de design talks already uh, on Tiramisu. Tiramisu is the next version of uh, uh, the uh, V2 replication. Um, Till now, we, have, uh, 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 we excluded the, the point that we need to, to actually group <laughs> different volumes when we do replication because at the end of the day, we're protecting workloads, right? This is what we serve, the applications. And the application doesn't reside in a single box, right? So we need to make sure that when we create a failure domain, it's complete from, and consistent point from application. This is why we need to deal at the group level. Uh, this not yet finalized. There's uh, 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 actually tomorrow and, and Friday still discussions in the senior community. If you're part of the senior community, please join us for these discussions and be part of it and able to ship the, the next versions. Uh, and finally, uh, a project like Kinberg, uh, if you're uh, 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 looking to contribute, and again, this started by the Open NFE folks, but we believe this is larger than uh, just one uh, uh, project in OpenStack because it, it's every, every service in OpenStack needs to be represented and be able to uh, 
served, and at the end of the day, it's, it's up to the operator, right? Uh, we're putting all of our eggs in open sack basket. It's time to protect them well and be able to resume. And with that, I want to open it now to some questions. Uh, the slides are available using this barcode, so feel free to scan it. Then we'll, we'll uh, get a copy. And feel free to see us if we are not able to address your questions in time. We have a microphone, so feel free to step up. And if not, we'll just try to replay your questions. All right. Uh, 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 let's <laughs> he beat you already. Yeah. <laughs> You're not? All right, go ahead. Uh, how late do we need? Uh, basically, how network sensitive is the RDD replication between sites? So, yeah, I, I, like, have you guys really tested this like, across oceans or whatnot, where, where you're trying to move, say, things from West Coast to like Sydney or something of that sort? It, so is the question about the stretch or about the replication? Uh, I, I, it's more of the, the how, how robust is the replication at handling that type of latency and possible like uh, interruptive activity? There, there is no issue with, with how long the delay is. In fact, we're looking at cases where you would actually be replaying the log hours later for another use case. So the latency is not the issue. Obviously, you have to have connectivity, and there will be retries if the, if the connection is not good. Okay. So is it basically just working on kind of like a log replication? Or a, a That's right. Yeah, the because the transaction is, log is being yeah. replaced, uh, replayed at the remote site. Yep. Is there a way to tell how far behind the log is for the replication? Hmm, that's a good question. Can you repeat the question? Uh, yeah, the question is like, uh, how how far behind is the the log when we are like uh, replaying in it? Uh, actually, it's not that far because when we send an I/O, the I/O goes into the journal and then into the image of the backend. So we are right away replicating that that blob. So it's it's not like yeah, it's it would uh, as w of course depends on the network throughput and the latencies that you have between both links. But uh, it's kind of um, it's really happening at the same time of the original I/O. So we're not delaying anything. You're a few seconds behind, but I think you're asking how can you tell how many seconds behind? Right. I don't know the answer to that, but maybe Jason can tell you. So to repeat for uh, the rest of the audience, you would use the RBD CLI, and you would get an answer of how many transactions behind you are. Yes. Hey, um, so if uh, everything goes into the journal, that means if uh, for some reason the replication falls behind, if it's interrupted, uh, you can potentially be in a situation where you run out of space. Is that, does that sound right uh, in the journal? Because there's it's, you have it's it's not the self journal. Okay. It's. Uh, it's a kind of, you have to picture it, it's like a, a, another image, basically, another SEP image. Okay. So there, we, don't have, uh, we don't have any space limitation on that. It's not the SEP journal. So it goes into the, the same pool? It uh, uh, can, be, can be a different one. Okay. It can be a different one. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. we can maximize this, of course. Uh, yeah. okay. Can we maybe just like get the mic and just, because otherwise, yeah, just thank you. Uh, I'm just doing this. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so if I enable the journal, so that means uh, already it's writing twice for the considering it's a file store and journal. So basically it will be now four times it will be writing uh, the same thing. There will be more I.O. Uh, the acknowledgment will go out after it's written to the journal. So the performance penalty is minimal or it's not even there. And if there is a client-side cache, the acknowledgment would go out even before you write to the journal. But this is correct. This but there is, is more traffic This is four IOs in the end, yeah. because so it's two different images, and then in a different pool as well, two different pools. So it's, yes, four IOs. Uh, yeah. <laughs> well, I'm going to keep it someone. Uh, OK. Yes. Um, so I, did I hear you say floating IP addresses? Yes. 
So th there's no way of doing this without using floating IP addresses? No, we said floating IP addresses when, um, in the case we have, you have to recover from one site to another one. It's just when um, you have to replay your, uh, your application stack on the other OpenStack environment. But it's, uh, it's not related to how we do the recovery or the, um, maybe just so go again. Cause when you restart your application images at the secondary site, they will have different IP addresses. Where do they get those IP addresses from? It's just the neutral internal DHCP. It's private IPs. And so if I want to, if I'm a user and I want to log in now to that application, then I have to do, get that into DNS. How does that work? Oh, yeah, well, this is not covered. <laughs> it's it's uh, yet again a uh, uh, disclaimer. Uh, it's, uh, we're more focusing on the storage part. But yeah, I agree that at some point you will have to find kind of a clever uh, mechanism on top, maybe relying on a global load balancer. Uh, just, well, um, I haven't really de developed that, but it was on the picture, sorry. Uh, you can use kind of a sort of global balancers uh, to, to root requests and just make sure that uh, the floating IP uh, failover uh, went well as well. Okay. And you, you're, you're talking about transactions, so this is just, this is transactions of, at a at database level or, or just? On, on which contest, uh, context? The, well, okay, so my application has got multiple servers. It's got app servers, it's got web servers, yeah, it's got database yeah. servers. When you're talking about transactions, in, in what context are you talking about them? We're talking about rights to the LibRBD journal. Okay. Right. So it's transactions at the step level, just like uh, when you're writing, and then it goes to LibRBD, to the back end, the mm -hmm. back end, and I guess it's not, not sure at which time we, we did <laughs> transactions, okay. so I can't really remember, but I believe it's uh, when we are doing the replication that we are talking about transactions. Okay. So it's and not database transactions or anything like this. Okay. And then I, I'm still just a little confused on how those, the images are brought up in the remote site. Okay. So it's um, basically we do a replication of the CEPH level. So the RBD mirroring is responsible, daemon is responsible for replicating the entire pool. So all the images are present in the glance pool to the other side. Uh, then we have to find a way. Uh, currently it's not available, but you have to also um, make sure that the other OpenStack environment is aware that those images exist on the other side. So if you lose site one, you have to take the database records and then uh, append them into the second site. Uh, later, when we have Kimbird, uh, we will be able to just uh, just synchronously maybe uh, have images, uh, metadata available on the other side. So that, that's the idea. So, okay, so appending those database records, how do those, my, my, my primary site It's kind of hacky, it's kind of hacky. Uh, but you have to, to, so to like set not, your- Another piece you're missing is the heat, what the story that I said earlier. So we're using heat as the configuration management. So heat basically capture all of the configuration, including IPs, et cetera. When you restore the images on the other side, you are actually able to do the changes before you restore them. Uh, so that way you'll be able to restore the same application on the other side. Okay. That was our disclaimer. We can take this that outside if you want. at the data because yeah. the, really. the whole application is not really happy is, is with the answer. Topic. So yeah. we can take this outside. There's, there's some holes. Okay, well, let's, let's discuss this outside then. All right. Any, any other questions or are we running out of time? Last one. Okay. Yeah. Uh, how to keep, uh, how to keep the uh, RBD mirror daemon always work well? Always? Always, sorry. Work well. Working oh, well. work well. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you mean by work well? It's just like uh, functioning? Uh, yes, always uh, uh, running, uh, running well. So like, uh, how can we um, uh, overcome the uh, initial limitations of the non-HA capabilities? Yeah. Uh, Jason? <laughs> I, uh, it's just like, I don't think we can do any pacemaker because we're transferring data. Yeah, so it's, it's just. Yes. Uh, I mean, it's, it's, besides monitoring your processes up and running, um, the, the status thing to let you know that things are falling behind and things are not being replicated is there. So you always send a warning. Um, Thank you. But yes, it's, de it's definitely our goal to get it. 
You're welcome. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.